Today we start reading the Spiderwick Chronicles book five. This is the last book, and this one is called The Wrath of Mulgarath. Wrath of Mulgarath, whom we saw briefly at the end of book four. It's not cute. Chapter one, in which the world is turned upside down. The pale light of the newly risen sun made the dew shimmer on the nearby grass as Jared, Mallory, and Simon trudged along the early morning roads. They were tired, but the need to get home kept them going. Mallory shivered in her thin white dress, clutching her sword so hard that her knuckles went white. Beside her, Simon shuffled along, kicking stray bits of asphalt. Jared was quiet, too. Each time his eyes closed, even for a moment, all he saw were goblins. Hundreds of goblins, with Mulgarath at their head. Jared tried to distract himself by planning what he would say to his mother when they finally got home. She was going to be furious with them for being gone all night, and even madder at Jared because of that thing with the knife. But he could explain everything now. He imagined telling her about the shape-shifting ogre, the rescue of Mallory from the dwarves, and the way they had tricked the elves. His mother would look at the sword and she would have to believe them, and then she would forgive Jared for everything. A sharp sound, like a tea kettle whistling at full volume, snapped him back to the present. They were at the gate of the Spiderwick estate. To Jared's horror, trash, paper, feathers, and broken furniture littered the lawn. What is all that? Mallory gasped. A screech drew Jared's eye upward, where Simon's griffin was chasing a small creature around the roof and knocking pieces of slate loose. Stray feathers drifted over the roof tiles. Byron, Simon called, but the griffin either didn't hear or chose to ignore him. Simon turned to Jared in exasperation. He shouldn't be up there. His wing is still hurt. What's he after? Mallory asked, squinting. A goblin, I think, said Jared slowly. The memory of teeth and claws red with blood awakened a horrible dread within him. Mom, Mallory gasped and began to run toward the house. Jared and Simon raced after her. Up close, they could see that the windows of the old estate were smashed and the front door hung by a single hinge. They darted inside, through the mudroom, stepping over scattered keys and torn coats. In the kitchen, water poured from the faucet, filling a sink piled with broken plates and spilling onto the floor where food from the overturned freezer was defrosting in wet piles. The wallboard had been punched open in places and plaster dust mingling with spilled flour and cereal covered the stove. The dining room table was still upright, but several of the chairs were knocked over, their caning ripped. One of their great uncle's paintings was slashed and the frame was cracked, although it still hung on the wall. The living room was worse. The television was shattered and their game console had been shoved through it. The sofas were ripped open and the stuffing was scattered across the floorboards like drifts of snow. And there, sitting on the remains of a brocade footstool, was Thimbletack. As Jared moved closer to the little brownie, he could see that Thimbletack had a long, raw scratch on his shoulder and that his hat was missing. He blinked up at Jared with wet, black eyes. All my fault. All my fault, Thimbletack said. I tried to fight. My magic's too slight. A tear rolled down his thin cheek. He wiped it away angrily. Goblins alone I might have driven off. The ogre just looked at me and scoffed. Where's mom? Jared demanded. He could feel himself trembling. Just before the break of day, they bound her and carried her away, Thimbletack said. They can't have. Simon's voice was close to a squeak. Mom, he called, rushing to the stairs and shouting up to the next landing. Mom, we have to do something, said Mallory. We saw her. Jared said softly, sitting down on the ruined couch. He felt lightheaded and hot and cold at the same time. At the quarry, she was the adult the goblins had with them. Mulgrath had her and we didn't even notice. We should have listened. I should have listened. I never should have opened Uncle Arthur's stupid book. The brownie shook his head vigorously. To protect the house and those inside is my duty, guide or no guide. But if I had destroyed it, like you said, none of this would have happened. Jared punched himself in the leg. Thimbletack scrubbed his eyes with the heel of his hand. No one knows if that is true or not. I hid it away. See what we got? 
Enough with the pity party. Neither of you is helping. Mallory squatted beside the footstool, handing the brownie his hat. Where would they have taken Mom? But Thimbletack shook his head sadly. Goblins are filthy things, the master worse than his hirelings. They would dwell somewhere as foul as they, but where that is, I cannot say. From above them, there was a whistle and a clatter. One goblin is still on the roof, said Simon, looking up. It must know. Jared stood up. We'd better stop Byron before he eats it. Right, said Simon, heading up the stairs. The three kids ran up the stairs and down the hall toward the attic. The bedroom doors on the second floor were open. Torn clothing, pillow, feathers, and ripped bedding spilled out into the hall. Outside, Jared and Simon's shared room cracked. Empty tanks lay on the floor. Simon froze, a stricken expression on his face. Lemon drop? Simon called. Jeffrey? Kitty? Come on, Jared said. As he steered Simon away from the wreckage of their room, he caught sight of the hall closet. The shelves were dripping with lotions and shampoos, which had also soaked the scattered towels. And at the bottom, near deep, deep scratches in the wallboard, the secret door to Arthur's library had been ripped off its hinges. How did they find it? Mallory asked. Simon shook his head. I guess they ransacked the place looking for it. Jared crouched down and wriggled into Arthur Spiderwick's library. Bright sunlight streaming through the single window showed the damage clearly. Tears burned his eyes as he stepped across a carpet of shredded pages. Arthur's books had been ripped free of their bindings and scattered. Torn sketches and toppled bookshelves littered the floor. Jared looked around the room helplessly. Well, Mallory called. Destroyed, Jared said. Everything's destroyed. Come on, Simon called. We have to get that goblin. Jared nodded his head, despite the fact that neither his brother nor his sister could see him, and moved numbly toward the door. There was something about the desecration of this one room, a room that had remained secret all these years, that made Jared feel as though nothing would ever be right again. Together, he, Simon, and Mallory trudged up the stairs to the attic, crossing over glittering pieces of smashed holiday ornaments and stepping past a broken dress form. In the dim light, Jared could see dust erupting in time with the clattering of griffin claws, and he could hear more screeching above them. One more level and we can step right onto the roof, Jared said, pointing to the final staircase. It led to the single highest room in the house, a small tower with half-boarded windows on all four sides. I think I heard some barking, Simon said as they climbed. That goblin must still be okay. When they reached the top of the tower, Mallory swung her sword at the window board, splintering them. Jared tried to pry off what was left loose. I'll go first, Simon said, hopping onto the ledge and gingerly climbing past the jagged slats onto the roof. Wait, Jared shouted. What makes you think you can control that griffin? But Simon didn't seem to be paying attention. Mallory strapped on a belt, wrapping it around the sword so it hung from her hip. Come on. Jared swung his legs over the sill and stepped out onto the slate. The sudden sunlight almost blinded him, and for a moment his blurry eyes scanned the forest beyond their lawn. Then he saw Simon approaching the griffin, who had cornered the goblin against one of the brick chimneys. The goblin was Hogsqueal. Chapter 2 In Which an Old Friend Returns Stop gopping, snail heads! Hogsquill yelled, help me. He was backed against a chimney, one hand holding his coat closed over a largest object, the other brandishing an empty slingshot menacingly. Hogsquill? Jared grinned at the sight of the hobgoblin, then stopped with a scowl. What are you doing here? Simon was holding the griffin back, mostly by standing between him and Hogsquill and yelling loudly. Byron turned his hawk head to the side and blinked, then pawed the ground with his talons, as though he were more feline than bird. Jared suspected that Byron thought they were playing a new game. Hogsquill hesitated, seeing Jared's face. I didn't know this was your house until the griffin showed up. You helped catch our mother? Jared could feel his face growing warm. Trash our house? Kill Simon's pets? He took two steps toward Hogsquill, hands fisting. He had trusted Hogsquill. He had liked him, and the hobgoblin had betrayed them. Jared could barely think with the roaring in his ears. I didn't kill anything. Hogsquill opened his coat a little, revealing a marmalade ball of fur. Kitty, Simon said, distracted by the sight of the kitten. In that moment, Byron lunged past Simon, catching the hobgoblin's arm in his beak. Ah, Hogsquill screamed. 
The cat yowled, jumping onto the roof. Byron, no, Simon yelled. Drop him. The griffin shook his head, whipping Hogsquill back and forth. The hobgoblin's shouts became louder. Do something, Jared called, panic, panicked. Simon stepped up to the griffin and hit him hard on the beak with his hand. No, he shouted. Oh, crap, don't do that, Mallory said, reaching for the sword at her waist. But instead of attacking, the griffin stopped shaking Hogsquill and looked at Simon with something like alarm. Drop him, Simon repeated, pointing to the slate roof. Hogsquill struggled ineffectually, pushing his fingers into Byron's nose slits and trying to bite the feathery neck with his baby teeth. The griffin ignored the hobgoblin, but didn't make a move to put him down either. Be careful, Jared told his brother. Better he eats Hogsquill than us. No! I'm sorry, gobstoppers, Hogsquill said, still writhing. I didn't mean it. Honest. Get me out of here. Help! Jared, Simon said. Grab Hogsquill, okay? Jared nodded, edging nearer. This close, he could smell the griffin. It had a feral scent, like a cat's fur. Simon put one hand on the top of Byron's beak and the other on the bottom and started to lever them apart, repeating, Be a good boy. Yes, drop the goblin. Hobgoblin, Hogsquill yelped. Are you crazy? Mallory hollered at her brother. The griffin turned his head abruptly in her direction, almost knocking Simon sprawling. Sorry, Mallory said in a much smaller voice. Jared gripped Hogsquill around the legs, around the legs. Got him. Hey, Yafner, we're not going to be playing tug-of-war with my body, right? Right? Jared just smiled grimly. Simon tried again to push Byron's beak open. Mallory, come and help me. Grab the bottom of the beak and I'll get the top. She stepped carefully across the slanted roof. The griffin eyed her nervously. When I say pull, Simon said, pull. Together, they tried to pry the griffin's jaws apart. Mallory's fingers slid into Byron's mouth as she strained, strained, nearly hanging from the griffin, trying to use her weight against him. Byron struggled and then suddenly gave in, opening his mouth and dropping Hogsquill's full weight into Jared's arms. Losing his balance, Jared slid backward on the shingles, letting go of Hogsquill and scrabbling for a handhold. The hobgoblin slid as well, knocking loose the, the shingle Jared was gripping onto. Jared slipped and grabbed hold of the gutter moments before he would have fallen off the side of the house. Simon and Mallory looked at Jared with wide eyes. He swallowed hard. As they moved to haul him back onto the roof, Jared saw Hogsquill make for the open window. He's getting away, Jared said, trying to pull himself higher. His elbow dug into dried leaves and mud that clotted the gutter. Forget about the stupid goblin, Mallory said. Grab hold of me. They hauled him back onto the roof. As soon as he was upright, Jared ran after Hogsquill with Mallory and Simon close behind. They thundered down the stairs. Hogsquill was sprawled in the hall outside their bedrooms, and yellow yarn was wrapping itself around him. Jared gaped as the yarn tied itself in a bow. Thimbletack hopped up on Hogsquill's head. I will help you fight the Fae. I believe I've a debt to pay. Jared looked at the yarn and then back at Thimbletack. I didn't know you could do that. He remembered how his shoelaces had seemed to tie themselves together and suddenly had an explanation. The little brownie grinned. Being unseen is not enough to get things clean. Hey, Hogsquill yelled. Get this crazy kipper off me. I wasn't running out on you. I was escaping from that tubey monster on the roof. Shut up, Mallory said. The goblin is not misunderstood, said Thimbletack. He is just plain no good. That naughty brownie's a fine one to talk, said Hogsquill. You're going to tell us everything you know or we're going to spread ketchup on you and put you right back up on that roof, said Jared. Right then, he was so angry that he meant every word of it. Thimbletack jumped down onto the leg of an overturned coffee table. That would be overly kind to a goblin in a bind. No, we'll set rats to nibble off your toes, poke out your eyes, and put them up your nose. Your fingers will remove with dull scissors and we'll wait until your confidence withers. Simon paled but said nothing. Hogsquill squirmed in his bindings. I'll tell you already, surly boots. No need to threaten. Where is our mom? Jared demanded. Where would they have taken her? Mulgrath's lair is at the dump on the edge of town. He's built a palace of trash, and it's defended by his goblin army and by other things besides. Don't be a pumpkin head. There is no way you can get in there. What other things are defending it? Jared demanded. 
dragons, Hogwheel, Hogsquill said. Little ones, mostly. Dragons? Jared repeated in horror. Ar Arthur's field guide had notes on dragons, but Arthur himself had never seen one. All of his accounts were second-hand, but even second-hand the stories were frightening. They described poisonous venom, teeth as sharp as daggers, and bodies that were as quick as whips. And you were part of Mulgrath's goblin army? Mallory asked, eyes narrowed. I had to be, Hogsquill exclaimed. Everyone was joining up. Where was I supposed to go, Chatterbasket? What did you tell them happened to the other goblins, the ones you were with before? Other goblins? Hogsquill said. For the last time, Lily Pants, I'm a hobgoblin. You might as well call a blackbird a crow. Jared sighed. So what did you say? Hogsquill rolled his eyes. What do you think, Beetle Guts? I said a troll ate him. Simple as that. If we untie you, will you take us to the dump? Mallory demanded. Probably too late, Hogsquill grunted. What was that? Jared scowled. Yes, Hogsquill said. Yes, I'll take you. Are you happy, Snodders? Just as long as I don't have to see that griffin again. But Jared, Simon said, a small smile twisting his mouth. It would be a lot faster if we flew. Wait now, I didn't agree to that, Hogsquill exclaimed. We need a plan, Mallory said, stepping away from the hobgoblin and lowering her voice. How can we beat an army of goblins, a dragon, and a shape-shifting ogre? There has to be something, said Jared, following her. They must have a weakness. The pages of Arthur's guide that had once been so clear in his mind had faded, his memory growing increasingly spotty. He tried to concentrate, to remember anything that might be important. Too bad we don't have the field guide. Simon stared at the broken fish tanks as though some answer could be found among the glass shards. But we know where Arthur is, said Jared carefully, a plan starting to form in his mind. We could ask him. Just how are you suggesting we do that? Mallory asked, one hand on her hip. I'm going to ask the elves to let me talk to him. Jared spoke as though they were a perfect that mm -hmm. Jared spoke as though that were a perfectly reasonable suggestion. Mallory's eyes widened with surprise. The last time we saw the elves, they weren't exactly what I would call friendly. Yeah, they wanted to trap me underground forever, said Simon. You have to trust me, Jared said slowly. I can do it. They promised that they wouldn't hold me there against my will ever again. I trust you, said Mallory. It's the elves I don't trust, and you shouldn't either. I'm going to come. Jared shook his head. There isn't enough time. Get Hogsquill to tell you everything he knows about Mulgrath. I'll be back as soon as I can. He looked down at the little brownie. I'll bring Thimbletack, if he'll come. I thought it had to be just you, said Simon. I have to be the only human, Jared said, his eyes still fixed on Thimbletack. I have not been out of the house in years. Without that, with that, Thimbletack walked to the edge of the chair and let Jared put him into the hood of Jared's sweatshirt. But I must put aside my fears. They left before Simon or Mallory could talk them out of it. Crossing the street, they started up the hill toward the elven grove. The late murky sky had deepened to a bright cloudless blue, and Jared hurried, afraid they didn't have much time. Chapter 3, in which Jared finds out things he doesn't want to know. The grove was the same as he remembered it tree rimmed with mushrooms in the center but this time when jared stepped into the middle nothing happened no branches laced together to trap him no roots wound around his ankles and no elves appeared to scold him hello jared yelled he waited a moment but the only reply was the distant calling of birds frustrated jared paced back and forth is anyone here i'm kind of in a hurry still nothing minutes passed Looking at the ring of mushrooms, he had an overwhelming urge to strike out at the elves. If only they hadn't taken Arthur. He had just lifted his foot to kick one when he heard a soft voice from the tree line. Reckless child, what are you doing in this place? It was the green-eyed female F elf, her hair tinged with more reds and browns than it had been before, and her gown was now deep amber and gold, like summer giving away to fall. Her voice sounded more sad than angry. Please, Jared said. Mulgarath has my mother. I have to save her. You have to let me talk to Arthur. 
What should I care for one mortal? She turned toward the trees. Do you know how many of my own people have been lost? How many dwarves, old as the stone beneath our feet, are no more? I saw it, Jared said. We were there. Please, I'll give you anything. I'll stay here if you want. She shook her head. The only thing you had that was of value to us is lost. Jared felt relief and terror at the same time. He needed to see Arthur, but he had nothing else to offer. We didn't have the guide, he said. We couldn't have given it to you then, but maybe we can get it back now. The green-eyed elf turned back with a scowl. I have no further interest in your tales. I, I can prove it. Jared reached back into his hood and pulled out Thimbletack and set him down in the grass. I told you our house brownie had the book. This is Thimbletack. The little brownie took off his hat and made a low bow, trembling slightly. Great lady, I know how this must look, but it is true I took the book. Your manners become you. She glanced at them both and then was silent for a moment. Jared shifted impatiently as Thimbletack climbed up Jared's leg and slid back into his hiding place. The green-eyed elf's silence unnerved Jared, but he forced himself to stay quiet. This might be their last chance to convince her. Finally, she continued, Our time to punish and to command is past. The moment we feared is upon us. Mulgarath has gathered a great army and is using the guide to make it even more fearsome. Jared nodded, although he was puzzled. He couldn't think of anything Mulgarath could do with the guide that would make an army more dangerous. It was just a book. Promise me this, mortal child, the green-eyed elf said. If Arthur's field guide comes again into your possession while you look for your mother, you will give it to us so that it can be destroyed. Jared nodded, giddily agreeing to anything that meant he would be able to see Arthur. I will. I'll bring it. No, she said. When it is time, we will come to you. She pointed upward and spoke something in a strange language. A single leaf spiraled from a high branch of an old oak. It drifted slowly as though it were fa falling through water instead of air. Your audience with Arthur Spiderwick will last as long as it takes that leaf to fall to the ground. Jared looked up toward where she pointed. As slowly as the leaf was moving, it still seemed too fast. What if that isn't enough time? She smiled coldly. Time is something that neither of us has the luxury of anymore, Jared Grace. But Jared barely noticed because walking toward them from the trees was a man in a tweed coat with graying patches of hair on the sides of his balding head. Leaves swept around him and dropped in a carpet in front of him so that his feet never touched the ground. He adjusted his spectacles nervously and peered at Jared. Jared could not help grinning. Arthur Spiderwick looked just like the picture in the library. Now everything would be all right. His great-great-uncle would explain what to do, and that would be that. Uncle Arthur, Jared began. I'm Jared. I do not believe I could possibly be your uncle child, Arthur said stiffly. To the best of my knowledge, my sister has no sons whatsoever. Well, actually, you're my great-great-uncle, Jared said, suddenly unsure of himself. But that's not important. That's nonsense. This wasn't going the way it was supposed to at all. You've been gone a long time, Jared explained carefully. Arthur scowled. A few months, perhaps. Thimbletack spoke up, climbing out of his hiding place and onto Jared's shoulder. Listen to the boy. It is the only way. We cannot afford to delay. Arthur peered down at the brownie and blinked twice. Hello, old man. How I have missed you. Is my Lucy well? What about my wife? Will you give them a message for me? Listen, Jared interrupted. Mulgarath has my mother, and you're the only one who knows what to do. Me? Arthur asked. Why should I know what to do? He pushed his spectacles higher. I would imagine that I would advise... Wait, how old are you? Nine, Jared replied, dreading what would come next. I would say that you should stay safe and leave the handling of such dangerous creatures to your elders. Didn't you hear me? Jared shouted. Mulgarath has my mother. There are no elders. I understand, Arthur said. However, you must 
No, you don't understand. Jared couldn't stop himself. It felt too good to finally just scream at someone. You don't even know how long you've been here. Lucinda is older than you now. You don't know anything. Arthur opened his mouth as if to speak, then closed it. He looked pale and shaky, but Jared found it hard to care. His eyes burned with unshed tears. On the other side of the ring of mushrooms, the single leaf was drifting ever closer to the ground. Mulgarath is a very dangerous ogre, Arthur said quietly. He didn't look at Jared when he spoke. Even the elves do not know how to stop him. He has a dragon, too, Jared said. Arthur looked up, suddenly with interest. A dragon? Really? Then he shook his head and his shoulders slumped. I can't tell you how to deal with any of this. I'm sorry. I simply don't know. Jared wanted to plead, to demand, but no words came. Arthur took a step closer, and when he spoke, his voice was very gentle. Child, if I always knew what to do, would I be here, trapped with the elves, never to see my own family again? I guess not, Jared said, closing his eyes. The leaf had reached his height. It wouldn't be long now before his time was up. I can't give you a solution, Arthur said. All I can give you is information. I wish I could do more. He continued. Goblins run in small packs, usually no more than ten. They follow Mulgarath because they're afraid of him. Otherwise, you would never see so many in one place. Without him leading them, they would fall into squabbling. But even with him, they probably aren't very organized. As for ogre, ogres, Mulgarath is typical of their kind. They're master shipshifters shape shifters clever sly and cruel strong too unfortunately one flaw that might help you is that they are often vain and prone to bragging like in the puss in boots story jared asked exactly arthur's eyes gleamed as he spoke ogres think a lot of themselves and want you to think a lot of them as well they love to hear themselves talk and the normal protections like that garment you're wearing are next to useless they're too powerful as for dragons, well, I must confess everything I know about them was culled from other researchers. Other researchers? You mean there are other people researching fairies? Arthur nodded. All over the world. Did you know there are fairies on every continent? There are variations, of course, much like with any other animal, but I digress. The subtype of dragon is probably of the European worm variety most common to this region. Very poisonous. I remember one account where a dragon lived on cow's milk. It got huge, and its venom poisoned everything, scorched the grass, and made the water undrinkable. Wait, Jared exclaimed. Our water burns your mouth if you drink it. Our well water. Very bad sign, Arthur sighed heavily and shook his head. Dragons are quick, but they can be killed the same as any other creature. The difficulty, of course, is the poison. It grows stronger as the dragon grows, and only a very small number of creatures are fast enough and brave enough to go after a dragon, the way a mongoose attacks a cobra. Jared looked at the leaf. It was almost to the ground. Arthur followed the look. My time talking to you is almost done. Will you give Lucinda a message for me? Sure, of course. Jared nodded. Tell her... But whatever Arthur was going to say was lost in the leaves that whirled around him, obscuring him from view. A tornado of leaves circled upward, and then nothing. Jared looked for the elf, but she was gone as well. As Jared left the boundary of the grove, he saw Byron clawing in the dirt. Simon sat on the griffin's back, petting the creature to calm it. Behind him, Mallory held the dwarven sword aloft, the metal gleaming in the sun. Hogsqueal sat at the beast's neck looking positively miserable. What are you doing here? Jared asked. I thought you said you trusted me. And we do, said Mallory. That's why we waited here instead of rushing in and hauling you out. We even have a plan. Simon held up a loop of rope. Come on, you can tell us what you found out from the elves on the way. So now, said Mallory, it's your turn to trust us.